We are now, today, we're celebrating Palm Sunday. And some of you may have um, noticed that in some of the churches, they have these palm branches, and they ask the priests to, you know, bless those palm branches. That is a practice, actually, that's not just here in the Philippines, but all over the world. Like I know that, um, like this picture, this one was taken in India, and there's one in the Christians in Iraq do this. And so this is basically to commemorate the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And so, which officially marks the Holy Week because we all know this Thursday, this uh, uh, Monday Thursday, Good Friday, Black Saturday, and then Easter Sunday is the ending of the Holy Week. I have a lot of fond memories um, in Holy Week, and one of them was um, when I was still a kid, I grew up in a province, and in our province, you know, um, the Holy Week is one of the, you know, highlights of um, our, our province, and um, there's a lot of festivities. Medyo hindi lang siya ganun kasaya, no? It's a bit toned down because sabi nila, you're not supposed to smile a lot during Holy Week, and you're not supposed to be happy a lot, and you're supposed to be focusing, but yet a lot of things are happening. I remember there's this um, thing that we do every Holy Week, and uh, my Lola would always um, host this pabasa. We call it pabasa. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's a, 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 a literary, um, yeah, it's a reading, okay? <laughs> it's a reading of the account of Jesus Christ. And so what's different about this is the people sing it. Do you still, are you still familiar with pabasa or passion? And so some of you hear that, ah, like that, right? So, and as a kid, we were, we were not, you know, we, were, we find it boring. And sorry for if you're watching this, and I hope that you go get offended with this, but I learned my lesson, okay? My Lola taught me, okay? But when I was doing that, we were so bored, my cousins and I. And so what we did when they, we, we were given the mic and it's our turn to read the pabasa, what we did is we made a rap out of it. <laughs> and so when we were rapping it, Lo and behold, a few minutes after that, my Lola has this big stick in her hand and it was chase, she was chasing us around, you know, outside of the house and wanting to you know, give us that rod. I also remember during Holy Week that you're not supposed to you know, play a lot so that you won't get you know, those, those bruises or those cuts because they say that if you get cut or you bleed or you had a, had a wound on a Holy Friday, especially on a Friday, that will take some time. If not, it won't get healed at all. And so it's a good thing that some of you here live in Manila and maybe hindi na kayo sanay sa ganon or you've not, you didn't grow up or grow up with those kinds of beliefs. But that is the norm, the norm in the provinces. In fact, not just that, but even this one. In our country, um, especially in the provinces, in central Luzon, uh, most, uh, you know, most specifically, we have some people who would flagellate themselves, okay, who would do this, they call this penitentia, and the reason they do that is because they believe that as they do this, they would earn forgiveness for their sins. Not just that, but even in some areas like in Pampanga and some parts of Central Luzon, there would even be reenactments of the crucifixion. Some people would volunteer themselves to be hung on the cross, nails piercing their hands so that you know, um, they could showcase what Jesus, what Jesus experienced on the cross 2,000 years ago, but also for them so that their sins also can be forgiven. You see, we live actually in a society, we live in a world, even us, we have this in us that somehow tells us that if we do something wrong, there is something that we need to do so that the wrong things that we, we did can be covered up or can be, um, you know, um, can be turned into good or can be solved or whatever. And so even for them, that's what they think that they need to do. We have like this balancing scale here, you know, this weighing scale. For those of you who are listening in the podcast, we have here a live weighing scale. And somehow we have this mentality that if we sin, there are things that we need to do in our lives. Like for example, praying. We put that on the other side, giving to the poor perhaps. Being kind to others. Okay? Giving charity work serving in the church. Somehow we think that if we do all these things, the good things that we do will outweigh the bad things that we have done. But somehow, since we are fallen people in the first place, every time we also commit mistakes, of course, the balance will tip in the other way again. And so to compensate that again, we try to cover it up again by giving more 
by serving more, by attending church more, by praying more, hoping that this would be the scenario. And so somehow, we have this mentality that if we do good, the bad things that we have done will be forgiven. Another reason why we do that, those things, those sacrifices, those practices, okay, or even those acts of kindness, because you may be thinking you are not doing those things, but guess what? Even us as you know, people here in church, we may be guilty of this as well. You may think that you're not doing this, but let me ask you this. What is the reason why you're praying to God every day? What is the reason why you're reading the Bible? What is the reason why you're giving to God? What is the reason why you're giving to charity? Because if it is about pardon of, for your sin, and guess again, another reason why, as I said, is because they want to have favor from God. They want to, want to have points with God or from God. And, you know, that, that happens all around the world in different kinds of religions. One of it is this one. In the Business Insider, there was an article about this practice, this festival in Nepal. And Hindu worshippers say, you know, they, they say that about 500,000 animals are killed in this festival, which happens about every three years. Imagine that 500,000 animals being slaughtered. And you know the reason why? Okay, that's the picture. Okay, I don't want to linger on that. Okay. Some of you might have nightmares later. Or you get hungry. So millions of Hindus from all over India and Nepal participate in the festival to honor the goddess Gadhimai, a Hindu deity who, de who devotees believe will grant them wishes if they sacrifice animals and birds. Somehow we think that the greater the sacrifice, the greater the rewards with our relationship with God. Somehow we, there's this mentality, perhaps in most humans, that when we do good, that when we deprive ourselves of something, God may notice us and either forgive our sins or grant us favor or answer our prayers. And so it would be good to actually evaluate those concepts, those mindsets based on the written word of God. And so a good question that we can ask today is this, can really those, can, can those sacrifices really earn forgiveness? Can those sacrifices really earn favor from God? We're going to look at Hebrews 10 to answer that and more. Hebrews 10 verse 1 says here, For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they have not ceased to be offered? Since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have, not, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written for of me in the scroll of the book. Verse 10, And by that, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What does it mean? What does it all mean? See, before answering that, let me just give you a picture first of the context with which this letter was written. See, we, all, we, don't, we may not know who the author of Hebrews is, but we know for certain the audience that he wishes to address. And so the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Christian believers or a group of Jewish believers, rather, in that time. And in that time, there was a pressure amongst these Jewish believers to either go back to their old way of life, their Jewish customs and beliefs, or marry you know, Christianity or the gospel with those Old Testament practices. I don't know what it is, what is forcing them, or... In, or, 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 or leading them to do that, but there was a sort of pressure for them to go back to Judaism or marry the gospel with Judaism. And so with that as the context, the author 
of Hebrews now writes a letter to correct that wrong mindset. In fact, in all of the book of Hebrews, you will find that the overall theme of this is the centrality and also the supremacy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as well as the grace that we can receive only in Jesus Christ. And so now here in chapter 10, he was painting a picture. Again, he was referring to the Old Testament sacrifices. He was referring to these practices and he in a way answers our question today. Does those sacrifices really mean something in terms of forgiveness of our sins and pardon from God and pleasure of God? Verse, five, uh, verse 4 says here, It is impossible. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Verse 6, In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. So with regards to our question earlier, the resounding answer is no. Sacrifices, good works, won't merit you forgiveness, won't merit you favor from God. It's good to end with prayer at this time, isn't it? Let's close the message. But you know what? The message in chapter 10 progresses and explains to us more about a concept that we need to understand, a truth that we need to understand in order for us not to be mistaken. You see, I believe the reason why a lot of people lean heavily on sacrifices and tradition and what they can do, they apply Scripture like that because they have a wrong understanding of what Jesus Christ has done for them. See, wrong application stems from a wrong comprehension of what Jesus Christ has done. And so for the remainder of my time, I want to share with you three foundational truths about what Jesus has done for us and the significance of that for us today. Number one, Christ's sacrifice is God's design. Christ's sacrifice is God's design. Verse 7 says there, Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. See, God's redemption plan, God sending His only Son, Jesus Christ, is not an accident. It is not a coincidence. It is done, planned for, and executed by God Himself. In in fact, in Hebrews chapter um, 13, verse 20, it says there that this will that He's partaking here talks about the eternal covenant that God has uh, you know, for us, for you and me. What is that eternal covenant? I like how um, one uh, respected pastor put it, John MacArthur. He said it this way. God the Father, because He loved God the Son, the first member of the Trinity, having a unique love for the second member of the Trinity, wanted to give Him a gift. The gift that he wanted to give him was a redeemed humanity who would spend forever and ever and ever praising him and glorifying him. That was the most marvelous way that God could deem to express his love to his son, giving him a great cloud, as it were, of redeemed people who would forever and ever praise him. That was the goal. That was the intention, that was the gift that God wants to give His one and only Son. How many of you know there's, the prob- there's a problem with this gift? See, many of us know that because of our sins, we have disqualified ourselves to be this good gift that God the Father wants to give to His one and only Son. Because we have fallen into sin, God needed to redeem first the gift before he gives it to his son. But here's an interesting, interesting twist in the story. See, Jesus is the one who's supposed to be the recipient of the gift. We, on the other hand, are the gift. But since we fell, the receiver of the gift first had to die for the gift. He first had to die for the gift. 
so that one day, as Revelations put it, we can be presented to him again as a bride without blemish or wrinkle. But here's an interesting, interesting thought in the story. Verse 7 says there, I have come to do your will. This pertains to Jesus Christ and his attitude towards redeeming humanity. This passage is saying Jesus was willing to participate in God's eternal covenant. Let me explain it this way. We all know that Jesus is all-knowing, right? Jesus knows everything, right? He knows everything everything that's going to happen to us. He knows everything that's going to happen even to him when he came here on earth. But isn't it interesting that even though he knew how painful it would be when that crown of thorns would be placed on his head, he knew how painful it would be for those soldiers to flog him at the back and at the front. He knew how exactly it, how it would feel when that nail would pierce his hands and, those nails, and that nail would pierce his feet. He knew the pain that he would incur when that spear you know, would, would, would pierce him. He knew the humiliation. He knew about the shame. He knew about the flogging. He knew about you know, the spitting on his face, the punch and the slaps that he would get. But the amazing thing is this. In spite of knowing all of those things, Jesus wrestled with it, yes. But eventually he said, Father, I'm here to do your will. Not my will be done, but your will to be done. That happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm reminded of um, a story of two brothers. Um, one is about six years old, and the other one is about four. Unfortunately, the younger brother, the four years old, incurred a certain sickness. And when they had him checked in the hospital, they couldn't find any, any specific cure for this sickness. And they said, after conducting some tests, and they said, the doctor said, the only way for this kid to survive is if you do a blood transfusion for him. If we change, if we, do, if we transfuse the blood. And so, and we need to do it emergent, uh, urgently, said the doctors. And so the parents tried to, you know, exhaust all the options as urgent as possible. And so they tried looking for relatives. They tried themselves if they're compatible, if their blood is compatible with the kid. And they could not find anyone at that time except for the older brother. And so the mom went to the older brother and said, son, your brother is really sick and he needs your blood so that he can be healed. And so the son, the six-year-old boy, he was trying to think, are you going to get my blood? And so he was crying and he was thinking, he was pondering a lot about, you know, what's going to happen. He was thinking and, you know, the, the mom was so surprised that this kid was, you know, um, thinking about it so much. In fact, he was at, at, point cry, at some points crying about it. And then he was, at, at one point he said, the, the boy said, after so much crying and much deliberating, the boy said to the mom, okay, mom, I'm willing. I'm going to give my blood to my brother. So they brought him to the hospital laid him on the bed beside his brother and they're about to do the procedure. And then when they were about to pierce, you know, his arm with a needle to get the blood, covered his eyes. And he was shaking and he was so afraid. And so when the doctor did it and flood, uh, blood started to flow, the boy said, got the mom's hand, said, Mom, am I going to die now? That is when the mom realized that is why he was having a hard time deciding whether to give his blood or not. Because for him, he thought, but by giving his blood, he will lose his life so that his brother will live. And that realization even made the, the mom break into tear, burst into tears more and more. Because she realized the kind of love that this young boy had for his brother. Because though he knew in his mind that he's going to die, he was so willing to lay down his life because it is for his brother. Aren't you amazed that Jesus, although he knew the kind of pain that he will incur, 
although he foreknew the kind of shame that he would encounter, he was very willing to go through all of that just because he saw you and the person seated right next to you as someone who is worth it. God's love is so much for us. This, divine, this, this, this redemption plan that he has, it is his design. It's not a coincidence. The amazing truth behind it is Jesus was even willing to sacrifice himself for us. Next point, Christ's sacrifice is also definitive. His sacrifice is definitive. Hebrews 12 or 10 verse 11 and 12 says this, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. See, in the Old Testament, there's this picture that priests would every single day, every year, their duty is to offer up sacrifices to God so that at least the people can receive forgiveness for their sins. But it says here that they will not cut it. But Jesus, on the other hand, one sacrifice, one sacrifice, and it was good for all humanity. I hope that you would indulge me in this, but the first time I read it, as I was preparing for this, there is one picture that came across my mind about, you know, Jesus offering for a single time and then sitting down at the right hand of God. It was the time when, you know, there's this, in the, in the, in the 1980s, there's this slam dunk game. Okay? And in this slam dunk game, you know, in this, this competition, Michael Jordan was there as a competitor. And then Michael Jordan, at that moment, wanted to win the competition. They, he surprised everyone by walking all the way to the end of the basketball court and then started to run. And then when he ran, he jumped at the free throw line and then with his tongue out, he dunked the ball and everyone rose from their feet and they were saying, that is it, that settles it, he's the man, he's the champion. Do so you remember that? Or maybe you've seen a competition wherein someone suddenly, you know, just came in there and did something amazing and they said, that's it, game over, competition ends, this guy is the winner. And I remember, I, I pictured that, that Jesus sitting down because of his sacrifice was so perfect, so sufficient, so definitive that after he has done it, God said, it is done that is it that is it comparing his sacrifice from the old testament sacrifices in hebrews 10 verse 1 it says here since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities he's saying here that those old sacrifices are mere shadows compared to the, the sacrifice that jesus has done in verse 3 it says here, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. And so the author of Hebrews is saying that these sacrifices, they're just shadows. They're not the real thing. It's supposed to point to what Jesus Christ will do eventually at their time. But then he's saying here that those are still reminders lang. Reminders that they are in sin and that they need forgiveness. How important are reminders? How many of you here, you, you receive a lot of reminders from Miralco, from Globe, from Smart. Isn't it amazing? But when you're trying to call for a, a help or if you want to reach for them for some service, it's so hard to get in touch with them. But then when it's time to pay the bills, you got a text message, you get an email, okay, you get a letter. If you're working for them, you know, we bless you. <laughs> but how many of you know a reminder is just a reminder? Okay? When you receive three reminders, when you go to, say you get three reminders from Miralco, you go to the Miralco shop to pay for your Miralco bill, you show your reminders, you show your text message, you show the bill and say to them, here are my reminders, it's for you, I'm paid. That doesn't work like that, isn't it? A reminder is just a reminder. You cannot use a reminder to pay for the penalty, to pay for the Jew. In the same way, these sacrifices are just reminders. They cannot in itself 
give you forgiveness of your sins. These reminders cannot earn you favor from God, but it points to a solution, the ultimate solution, and that is what Jesus has done for us. Because Jesus' sacrifice for us is definitive. I like what Jesus said on the cross. One of his last words was this. It is finished. It is finished. In the Greek, it is the word that, use, that was used there is tetelestai. Tetelestai is a word that, use, that is used by carpenters. We all know Jesus is a carpenter. And when, uh, when a carpenter says tetelestai, it's at the point wherein he is handing over a, a, a carpentry work and as he is giving it to the person, you know, the one who buys perhaps that carpentry work, he's saying tetelestai. And the meaning of that is nothing more to add, nothing more to fix. Nothing more to add, nothing more to fix. See, Jesus' sacrifice for you and me is so definitive, it is so perfect, it is all sufficient that there is nothing more that we can add and that there's nothing more that we need to fix. Some of us, perhaps, really need to hear this thought because somehow your walk as a Christian has been hampered or hindered because somehow there is in our minds that we need to perform for God that we need to do this for God in order that we gain the blessings and the favor from God, guess what? Christ's work is definitive. There's nothing more that you need to add. There's nothing more that you need to fix because God is, you know, predisposed to bless you already because of Christ. God already is favored upon you. His favor is upon you all because of what Jesus Christ has done. It is finished it is complete. It is sufficient. It is perfect. Second Corinthians 5.21 put it this way. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Which leads me to my last point. Christ's sacrifice delivers us from our, from our sins. Christ's sacrifice completely, fully delivers us from our sins. Hebrews verse 14, it says, Therefore, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Look at those words, perfected and being sanctified. How much are you forgiven? Perfectly. How much are you forgiven? Perfectly. And guess what? You're also being made holy every single day. That word perfect there means justification or justified. When you say justified, it means just as if you've never sinned. Just as if you'd never sinned. That's how perfect this forgiveness that we have in Christ, if you would but put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In verse 17, it says there, and then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. How many of you would agree it's one thing to forgive, but it's another thing to forget? Especially if the damage done to you is so severe, so hurtful, it is hard to forget, isn't it? Some of you, you still remember the very words that your grade one teacher told you when you were still grade one 50 years ago because that's how painful it was. It is hard to forgive, it is hard to forget. But guess what? God loves you. God loves you so much that when he looks at you, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, when he looks at you and he sees maybe you're ashamed of your past, but God doesn't see your past anymore. God sees Christ in you today. And that is why he remembers not your sins and your lawless deeds no more. So what do we do? Now that we know that Christ's sacrifice is God's design and that he was very willing to sacrifice himself for us, what do we do now knowing that Christ's sacrifice is definitive, it's complete and it's perfect, nothing more to add, nothing more to fix? What do we do know with the fact that we know now that Christ has delivered us because of his sacrifice from all sins? 
Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, this sacrifice that He has made for us, the forgiveness that it comes with, the salvation and redemption that, that comes with it is a gift of God. Some of you here, I believe, you've never received that gift yet. See, a gift is not something that you pay for, not something that you buy for yourself. It's given out of the benevolence of the giver. But some of us, perhaps, we're saying to God, Lord, I don't want to receive that gift yet because I still need to prove myself to you. I still need to do this. I still need to arrange my life. I still need to make my life right. Guess what the Bible says? While you were still sinners, this gift has already been given to you. The most appropriate response is just to receive that gift. Some of you here, you've received this gift before. Maybe a year ago, a month ago, or maybe 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. But can I ask you something? Are you still as excited today in cherishing that gift as the day that you first received it? Do you still appreciate today that gift? Because some of us, when people give us gifts, some of them, nalagil natin sa kanto and it accumulates dust. Is it like this as well? Is the gift of Christ, the sacrifice that He has made for us, just out there accumulating dust? Are we still excited? Do we still appreciate that gift that God has given us? Because that is the proper motivation for us to do all these things that God has called us to do. Those good works, that will follow as long as you appreciate the gift of God for you on a daily, daily, daily basis. Let me end with this story. I remember the story of this mom and her child, her daughter. Um, the mom, unfortunately, acquired some burns and her face was all burned and her, some, uh, some parts of her hands were heavily burned. And so, it happened when the kid was still very young. And so, as the kid was growing up, went to school, and in school, she would encounter some you know, some teasing from her classmates. Her classmates would always say, you know, your mom is so ugly. Your mom is so ugly. She has burns all over her face. She has burns all over her hands. Ew, your mom is so ugly. And so it went into the heart of this girl and to the point that not only was she awkward about the truth of what happened to her mom, but to a point that she is already ashamed of her mom. And so the young girl what she would do is she would try to, you know, do things on herself. She would dress right. She would beautify herself so that she would be less associated with the mom so that she would be treated by her friends as herself. That all changed when one day that girl and the mom had a conversation. The girl asked, Mom, why do you have those burns anyway? And the mom, with a smile on her face, Explain to her child. You see, I got these cars when you're still a baby. Unfortunately, our house then caught fire. And as the house was burning, I tried to rescue you because you were left in your room. And as I entered your room, I saw your crib there and there's this huge wood on fire that is about to fall on you. And what I did is I went over your crib, got you, and tried to stop that wood from falling, it caused my hands to be burned and my face as well. Hearing the story behind the scars, the small girl started to cry because she started to appreciate and know that the reason why she is well is because of her mom's sacrifice. And now that she has fully understood the sacrifice of the mom every single day that they would go out, she would grab her mom's hand and she would tell the people, this is my mom. She sacrificed for me. She would go to her classmates and say, the 
That's my mom. That's my mom. She was so proud of her mom. See, my goal in my prayer for us today is that we would have a proper understanding, a proper comprehension and appreciation of what Jesus Christ has done for every single one of us. Because when we do, when we fully, at least a glimpse of the love of God for us, that will radically transform how you think and how you live this life. That is what will make you not just have a holy week, but a blessed every single day of the year. Amen. Can you all stand up? You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, it also says there's one sacrifice that we can do as a reasonable response to the truth that the Hebrew author has just laid. And that is, he said, a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. See, a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving pleases God. Why? Because it is not about what we have done, but we're seeing, speaking of what He has done. It's not putting our faith on what we can do or what happened in the past. A sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving is about thanking God for the forgiveness that He has given us. Thanking God for the life that we have. Thanking God for what not we have done, but what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. And so I'd like for us, as we end the service, I'd like for us to appreciate God. Thank God. What among you you love God and you appreciate Him? Lord, we thank you, Lord God, in the midst of your church community, Lord God, this afternoon. Lord, we just exalt your name, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your love for us, for the sacrifice that you've made willingly. Lord, thank you. Thank you, God. You know, I believe that some of you here, God wants to really just birth something new in your life. God wants you to receive that gift. I believe God is speaking to some of you right now and God wants you to experience, you know, not just a, you know, just like a churchy experience, but a real personal experience of His love in your life. I believe some of you, God is calling to receive that free gift of salvation that He's offering. And if you are here, you're saying, God, Lord, I'm going to come home to you right now. I'm not going to run away from it. I'm not going to, you know, try to reason more, but I just want to respond to that. I want to receive of that grace if that is you. Can I ask you to please raise your hand? Yes, I see those hands. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Lord, thank you for our brothers and sisters, Lord. God, Lord, I pray. Lord, thank you that it is you who is igniting, Lord God, right now, that love, that forgiveness, Lord God, in, uh, Lord, in their lives. Father, I pray. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters, Lord God, for responding, Lord God, to, to your love and to your tugging of their hearts, Lord God. Lord, I pray. May they completely and fully experience your love indeed, Lord God, in their lives. Father, I pray that you would assign people, Lord God, who would help them understand more about your love for them, Lord God. People who will disciple them would lead them and help them in this journey that they now have in you. In Jesus' name, amen.